All right. So I'm here uh, with Stuart Morris. No, actually, no, no, Joseph pardon me, Wilson. Joseph Wilson, from the <laughs> University okay. of Florida. Yes. Okay. And um, so why don't you tell us about uh, how you got involved in CPTC? Oh, sure. Um, so I've, um, I've been the advisor for our student InfoSec team. It's a student organization at UF since about uh, uh, 2013, I think. Uh, at that time, that, that club was formed by uh, actually John Sawyer and Jordan Wine, uh, Wines, who um, is a Vector 35. John Sawyer's at IO Active. They were on a DEF CON CTF team and won in 2006 and 2007 and said, we got to get students involved in this. But anyway, I've been involved in that club. Uh, I uh, heard about CPTC uh, a couple of times. Actually, we heard about it from people at UCF. Uh, they had participated and said, this is a great thing. So um, we put a team together. Um, John Woodman, one of the students, was uh, very active uh, with uh, working with that group. He's now with, uh, with Mandy. And, and uh, they, uh, we've participated for a couple of uh, couple of years, uh, I think since 2019, um, but this is the first year we've uh, won our region. So we're very excited and very happy to be here. It's a great competition. Yeah, so so how long have you been in InfoSec yourself? Uh, well, I actually got interested in InfoSec around uh, 2011. Uh, there was a sysadmin, a sysadmin who's, who um, said, oh, these students are writing terrible code. They don't know anything about it. So I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I, I found Robert Secord's uh, Secure Coding in C and C++ book and started teaching a class based on that because I, I knew that our students were writing the malware ready code of the future. And I wanted to get them away from that. But I couldn't figure out how to get students interested in studying information security. So I took a sabbatical. I actually went, I went to the CISI conference and uh, took a, a, a seminar in uh, ethical hacking with Jerry Vers uh, Jesse Versalin, sorry. And, uh, and I thought, you know, students probably would get interested primarily from the red team because, you know, hacking is fun, you know. So oh, yeah. uh, I, I took a sabbatical, took some SANS courses, uh, came back, uh, developed a penetration testing course, later a malware reverse engineering course. And I wanted to get our undergraduates interested in studying InfoSec so they might actually go on to be graduate students and do you know, groundbreaking work in, in helping do it right. So that's how I got involved. And, and the club is, has grown when I first got involved with them in 2013. I think there were eight people who liked to CTF. Um, they, uh, I, I, I came to him, I said, you guys need to become an official university organization. They said, I don't know. They think we're hackers. They're really upset about that. I said, no, no, you need to do this. You can get money to do what you want to do. They said, well, maybe they were pretty suspicious. I said, no, in four years, this club will have 100 people. Well, I was wrong. It was five years. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just taken off since then. And it's not because of me. It's because it's the thing that's happening, you know. And uh, I'm just sort of there for the ride. The students do most of the work. I, I hate to say it. They are tireless. It's really great. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what drew me in, too. I went to DEF CON and I saw how excited everybody was. And I said, I need to capture all this enthusiasm and get it in my classes somehow. And, but, you know, I, this is sort of just being an authority figure. I just sort of am the responsible party to sort of like uh, protect them from the administration and make excuses for them and stuff like they learned to pick locks. So then they started going where they weren't supposed to go. And I'm like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I understand, but you have to like try to avoid getting caught in the holy of holies and stuff. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, on a regular basis, probably about once a semester, we'll get maybe twice, uh, get a UF incident response team uh, uh, notification about something that somebody was doing, probably in a CTF, usually in a CTF. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, you know, navigate that, those waters uh, in, in uh, concert with the students. Uh, it can be interesting. One of the students on our uh, on our team um, uh, is actually, uh, uh, he's a, uh, he, he's a, a OSWE certified and, and does uh, bug bounties. Uh, so he was trying to figure out how to do uh, bug bounties uh, from home. Uh, Robert Dick, he's a really sharp kid. Uh, yeah. And uh, he's going to go places, you know, but you, it is difficult sometimes uh, because of the uh, activity to to chart the waters between having to uh, satisfy uh, uh, the 
the computational requirements of your network uh, administrators and still get what you need to do done. It, it can be tricky, but there's usually a way. I think it's gotten a lot easier with virtual environments now. Now it's easy to keep the hacking stuff really isolated from the rest of the network. That's true. Uh, the uh, the penetration testing course that I teach and the malware reverse engineering, I, I use a, a virtual environment inside a, an ESX uh, cluster that is separated from the internet. Uh, that's made a, a big difference in the number of incident responses over the years. Yeah, so, so what's your program like? How do you prepare your students for these competitions? Well, of course we have the, uh, the undergraduate program. We don't actually have a separate uh, cybersecurity program. Um, mo uh, the, uh, the people uh, that uh, are in InfoSec at uh, UF, uh, uh, we have the uh, Florida Institute for Computers uh, com uh, for Cybersecurity. Um, that in, in our department, people in that are include, uh, include uh, Patrick Trainer and uh, Kevin Butler, uh, who were at Penn State with uh, Patrick McDaniel and Tom Shrimpton, uh, Vincent Ben Chandler, uh, Sarah Rampazzi from Italy. The, most of us, we really agree that um, information security is part of computing. It's not a separate thing. You really, if you understand the whole, the whole gamut, then you're better off. So we try. Uh, we have not tried to create a a separate cyber track that's more. Uh, uh, how should I say? Just uh, just security related. Um, but um, we do have a number of security courses and are and are about to probably get a. We're about to apply for the uh, uh, CAE uh, uh, CD uh, program. We've had a CAER for a number of years, uh, but not an instructional program. Uh, for a variety of reasons, there are uh, hoops you have to jump through, and uh, yeah. you know we're jumping through those hoops uh, in a in a pattern and slow fashion. You know things move slowly at the university, but uh, the students, of course, uh, most of the students are from that background, but not all of them. We've had uh, students in chemistry and other other uh, disciplines who are uh, on our on our uh, uh, our CCDC and uh, CPTC teams. But um, the primary thing that people did, uh, the students did to get ready for CPTC here is they have a cyber range that uh, they have their red team meet every week or more. And uh, uh, most of those people are doing CTFs as well, but uh, they were primarily doing, uh, you know, hack the box challenges and things of that nature and trying to make sure they knew about the kinds of, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, vulnerabilities they'd run into here. But also they've been studying, uh, the reports from previous CPTCs to see what kinds of things are seem to be um, common to the excellent uh, teams, and it's a it's a different game when you're actually doing penetration testing than just popping boxes. There are so many kinds of vulnerabilities that don't rise to the level of remote code execution, you know, or privilege escalation, and uh, so it's really a, a difficult job for students to spend enough time to understand that well before they before they graduate along with the many other things they've got to do. Our students work hard though, and they do a great job of it. So, you know, here we are. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about the soft skills, like uh, analyzing something in terms of business needs and communicating with management? That's so important. Uh, my my pin, uh, my pin tweet is uh, all, all security is education, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, Everything we do is really education. Communication is education. <laughs> and uh, our, our team lead, our, our captain, uh, Cole McMullen, he's, uh, he's a double major, his second uh, computer science and English. And uh, <laughs> he made a big difference in our first CPTC uh, appearance uh, when he made a presentation and all the coaches who were watching the presentation said, wow, that's incredible. That was so clear. I mean, he really set the bar for the rest of the team. Yeah, I had a student one time in one of my classes and I required presentations and he didn't show up for his presentation, but he got hired to make a TV commercial <laughs> and he did a good job. And he said, will that count? And I said, yeah, I think that sure. counts. <laughs> yeah, practical experience is really important. Uh, and uh, yeah, the uh, that's one of the things in, in the uh, pen test class that I, I teach that I try to uh, uh, in instill in people is that they need to be communicating to everyone, not just 
not just to InfoSec uh, uh, Illuminati. Uh, there's going to be the pointy haired boss who has to understand why it's important to do a good thing. And often the most complicated attacks are not the most important. You need to figure out what is the real risk. And it's usually something very simple, like a default password or something. So uh, that happens so often. Uh, by the way, I did want to tell you that I uh, I do reference you in in my pen test class. There's a there's a blog post you have about Windows 8.1 pass the hash and uh, registry settings that enable it uh, that uh, that I refer to. Oh Thank yeah, you. well, well, I'm glad if any of that stuff helps. This stuff is going all over the place now. You know, when I started, it was pretty new and. But there was no Kali, there was no backtrack. It was pretty hard. It's getting pretty easy now. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, the the tool set is always improving and breaking and changing, and uh, it's surprising how hard. You know, it's one of the interesting things in the uh, uh, pen test class is that you'd think oh, it's easy to find vulnerable machines, but if people do default installs. Yeah, they're generally very secure, and it's really tricky to inst to institute these changes that that unwittingly uh, network administrators and users do. It's really tricky to find that combination. Yeah, you know, I think this is what I spend most of my time doing is writing bad apps to hack into. <laughs> yeah. I remember I wanted to do um, SSL uh, S. Um, uh, maybe I'm not going to be able to remember it. There's a uh, single sign-on technique okay. that's used on the web. And it had the early versions had these famous vulnerabilities. There's a whole BERT plugin just to exploit them. And I couldn't find a vulnerable version. I actually had to take a modern version and put the bugs back in. It took like a week. But anyway. Yeah, I, I completely understand. I have I have uh, old versions of software like Nginx that I've slightly modified and so forth. You know, it's it's awful. <laughs> I'm doing consulting and people are paying me to write broken apps to hack into it. It's that's good because I'm not skilled enough to write a good app. Yeah. You know, there's a different kind of skill to writing up an appropriately broken app. app so uh, don't, don't feel bad. I, I, I appreciate that, that uh, uh, requirement that's you know, uh, imposed. It really is game design. So I used to write games and you know, I'm still writing games. That's what we're doing. It's all yeah, I, learning. Yeah. I try, I try to uh, keep a, I, I, I didn't. I didn't really know about the uh, term gamification uh, about classes uh, when I started doing what people would call gamification, but uh, I try to keep things um, uh, interesting so that people have externalities that will provide them value beyond what they're supposed to learn. So that they'll go ahead and do a thing that they might not otherwise do, so they can get that value that they need to get to be able to do something else. It's a, it's a surprising uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, track that people's minds go through when they try to decide, what am I going to concentrate on? Yeah. Well, I remember when I started, I did physics and math, and I would really not read the chapter. I would do the problems and only go back to the chapter when I got stuck. And that's why I think CTFs do this. There's no instruction, no lecture. You just have puzzles, and then you figure it out. And the amazing thing to me is when I do teacher training in the summer with a room full of 25 college professors, I say, okay, I could cover one course with the lectures and the projects. We could just do CTFs and cover five courses with no lectures. And none of them wanted to hear the lectures. <laughs> That's great. I I, <laughs> this is a, I, I question the value of lectures. One of my uh, co colleagues has say, removed the lectures from her course and said, you know, nobody wants that. It doesn't matter. We just do CTFs. I said, well, that might very well be true. Well, I started flipping the uh, the courses and uh, have uh, recorded lectures. And uh, in class uh, for the malware reverse engineering, for example, we'll work on reversing software. We'll work on analyzing uh, assembly code or visual basic code or whatever it happens to be. It's uh, it's important for people to see, to, to get that uh, just enough so that they can solve something on their own and get that that endorphin rush of saying yeah. i did it it's so wonderful and i caution my students against helping people too much yeah i think the problem with most ctfs like especially the defcon one is it's just too hard it's impossible you just splat like a bug on the windscreen and give up and say i can't do this 
I, that's why I make easier ones. There has to be easier challenges. And then you can have hard ones after that. But there has right. to be one with just step by step. It's true. The uh, the bar for uh, reversing and pwn challenges in, in CTFs that appear on CTF time now is extremely high. And uh, uh, we, we've had some really talented uh, uh, pwn and uh, reverse engineering uh, students, but they have to work very hard to uh, to keep up to date with uh, all of the uh, all of the specific kinds of things that people are going to do because there are there are sort of trends in the CTF problems that they have to follow and if you don't keep a, a, abreast of those uh, those topics and techniques, it's really hard to compete. Yeah, yeah. So, what did you do before you did security? Well, I'm I was uh, trained as a as, as a uh, programming language person. I went to the University of Virginia and studied under Terry Pratt. And I thought I'm going to save the world for programming languages. And I got out in the uh, the late uh, uh, the mid 80s, late 80s, and uh, all the programming language work left the universities and went to the companies. And I thought this is interesting. I got involved in computer vision with a guy from the math department at uh, UF. Uh, for a long time, we were the image algebra guys. And then after that, I uh, got interested in one of, working with one of his students on uh, landmine detection, actually. Oh. <laughs> so I worked for quite a while with Fort Belvoir um, doing uh, detection of landmines in, uh, in ground penetrating radar imagery. Yeah, I was wondering how you did it. Radar would be the way, I guess. The, there are different techniques. You know, you can use metal detectors as well. Uh, the, I, it's it's interesting when you talk about landmines. Everybody has an angle. They say, ah, this will work, and uh, you know they're they're partly right. Uh, it's it's definitely an interesting uh, problem. But uh, it's that work was so um, I, I felt it was important, and it was also lucrative for us because we had plenty of funding. There were not as sort of a niche, not many people were doing it. So I really, you know, I said, you know, I'd like to do more InfoSec, but I could never get away from it because like, I, I can't stop this thing that we're doing, you know? So it was interesting, but uh, it was probably through the programming languages element. And well, actually, okay. When we were back at the university, a, 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 another colleague and I found a, a privileged escalation vulnerability in our VAX uh, system. And, uh, I won't say we exploited it, but uh, uh, we we tried to help people when the system administrators weren't available. Uh, and you know, if I had known at that time that you could make a living doing that, I would have said, "How much do I have to pay to get that job?" <laughs> you know? I know that's it's... why the students are so happy. And and the thing that that I didn't anticipate is after I was on the red team for a while, I sort of got fed up with it. You know, it's. Uh, after a while, it's just, yeah, somebody found another bug. Right. And then you wonder, you know, how could you stop this? That's actually a much more yeah. difficult problem. It definitely is. And uh, that's that's where I, that was my uh, intent all along. And I think it's it's true. I, of, of many of the students as well, their, their path follows that progression. They're interested in the red team to begin with. And then they start to think about it and say, well, how can you fix this? You know what can we do, and that's what uh, that's why I wanted to drive students towards uh, potentially getting into graduate programs, and doing information so. security. So, what kind of jobs do your students get? Well, there's a there's a real variety. The uh, uh, the captain of our C, uh, CCDC team from a few years ago uh, went to Amazon and is a red teamer there. Uh, there are a lot of students. Um, a fair number who uh, leave um, and do vulnerability research, which is of course uh, still a, a red team uh, sort of uh, element, but uh, it's, it, it, it's uh, how should I say, it's, it's more investigative in nature uh, than your typical penetration testing approach. So this is, is this bug bounties or is this inside companies fixing their products? No, I'm, I'm talking about at, at companies like uh, Raytheon SI and, and others, uh, you know, that, that uh, there are a number of students. We have a, a relatively good relationship with Raytheon. Uh, there's also Cromulants in Florida or, or Cormulants, sorry, in Florida that um, several students have left the malware reverse engineering class and uh, gone to do those, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, there are people who also uh, work at a, a variety of uh, uh, companies just in, in uh, generic uh, security roles as security consultants. Um, so it varies. Yeah. And so it, for beginners, uh, what would your advice be? Like high school students, what, what can they do? What should they expect? 
Yeah, the I think that uh, that high school students can expect something that we don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> I'm pretty sure of that. But uh, it it is uh, it is tricky to get involved in uh, in high school uh, and junior high uh, or uh, middle school, whatever. Uh, it it can be uh, tricky to get. Um, involved because there's not a community necessarily. And building that community is something that is so important. Uh, understanding that you need to work with other people to really learn things. It's not the kind of thing where you just sit in a dark room and don't communicate to anybody, read manuals. Maybe it was sometime, but I've never experienced uh, that as a successful path uh, to understanding computer science or information security. So I think that, uh, there are the uh, compet competitions that can be extremely helpful. Um, the Cyber Patriot, uh, Pico CTF is a wonderful resource for people who want to learn about uh, the the kinds of things that you can that you can do that you never would have believed you could do. You know, uh, Jordan Wines in a presentation uh, that he had, uh, corrupting the youth, right, was his presentation that he gave. I think first at his church, and had a group of. Uh, kids that uh, he he wanted to teach how to how to have the hacker mindset, you know he he has reiterated the thing that we know uh, hacking is a mindset not a tool set, and uh, there are kids out there who are ready to do these kinds of things. They are they are ready to solve problems, and that's what it's about solving problems. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. It's a penetrating analytical mindset. And they're just a different kind of person. My, I, I know one of my students uh, was in child development and moved over to being a hacker, became the most lethal red teamer ever. And she just hacks everything. She walks past things. It's just, they look at something, they immediately see a way to do something strange with it. It's yeah, it's, uh, it reminds me of a, uh, a phrase that... Uh... Uh, that Scott Carson, a, a grad student uh, a colleague of mine, had, he would say, you know, if you can't make it work, make it work, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, it, it all started with the Model Railroad Club at MIT, building model railroads out yeah, of we'll telephone see. parts, and that's the fundamental thing, you know. And I remember when I was a kid, we were just poor. They said, Dad would never want you buy anything. He said, if you need anything, go to the junk pile and figure out how to make what you need out of the junk. I didn't know that was a useful skill I was developing. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody uh, uh, who is uh, involved in, in uh, computing and information security has some element of that uh, either builder or fixer uh, in them. Uh, and there are people who have that, who, who don't have an opportunity to employ it in a useful way. And it can be, uh, it can be frustrating for kids. Uh, so I, I really... Uh, I really hope, you know, when I retire that I can somehow be involved in, in helping, uh, helping younger kids uh, get involved in, uh, in, the, uh, in the InfoSec game, not necessarily by talking about InfoSec, but by talking about problem solving, by not talking about, by doing problem solving, because it's the doing that's important. Well, there's all these opportunities at all the conventions and such. I mean, a lot of people just volunteer there to help. And I know this is something you, you made me think of earlier when you talked about people that are just alone in a room tinkering away with things. A lot of them start that way. But this is what I always tell my students. You have to get out and meet people. You have to join like a local B-sides or a club or a college is good if you've got one. You have to somehow be in the community so people see you and you find out what's happening. And then they need to hire somebody. They'll realize that you're there. I definitely encourage students to... Uh to present anything they have done that's interesting or unique at a, at a uh, HackerCon. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, the, they're not the same, they don't fulfill the same role as academic conventions. They are about, uh, not about indoctrination, but about uh, setting expectations and learning about possibilities which is true of academic conferences as well, but they're a little bit stodgier. And um, I've, I've uh, uh, suggested to students whenever they can, whenever they have something interesting to present it. I know uh, I mentioned Terry Tebow who went to work for Amazon. He had done a pres uh, presentation at Orlando B-Sides. There are several other students who've done that kind of thing. It's really helpful. And I encourage students also to work on open source security projects. If you, it, if you are the kind of person who works 
to help somebody improve tools and improve the world for everybody else. Employers look at that. Other people look at that. You'll make more contacts. You'll learn more and you'll be able to do more. And that's what it's about. Nobody can do everything. There is so much that can be done. No, you can't fit it all. Nobody's got that big of a brain, but uh, everybody can do enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like very exciting program you got there and you keep the students enthusiastic. Uh, is, are there any final remarks you want to make? Uh, no, I just want to thank everybody who has, uh, who has helped UF uh, uh, Student InfoSec team over the years. And, uh, and I will tell people, if you're interested in, in uh, InfoSec, UF's another place. It is, there are many of them. There, uh, you know, uh, uh, your institution in San Francisco is great. You know, there are so many possibilities. Just if people are interested in InfoSec at all, go do it. It's, it's easy to get involved. It's a lifelong passion. Yeah, yeah, and you have to keep learning forever. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you. I'll stop this one.